All right, good afternoon. If you take your seats, we'll get started. Like I said, once again, welcome to this very first presentation of academic year 2022 of the Command and General Staff School and the Command and General Staff College Foundation's co-sponsored interagency brown bag lecture series. My name is Rod Cox. I'm with the Command and General Staff College Foundation. And on behalf of my partner, Colonel Tommy Cardoni, Mr. Marv Nichols of the Command and General Staff School, sir, thank you. It's our pleasure to welcome you to this lecture series that is designed to enhance your interagency education and curriculum while here at the Command and General Staff College. This lecture series is made possible by a grant from the Perot Foundation and support from my partners at First Command Financial Services. Matt and Siobhan, thank you very much. Appreciate you being here and appreciate the continued support of our foundation. I want to note that our next interagency brown bag lecture presentation is scheduled for Wednesday, 20 October, where we'll have a discussion on the Central Intelligence Agency. It will be right here, same location, same time, 1230. And please note that this presentation will not be broadcast, so please plan to attend in person. I know you'll want to see it. On that note, today's presentation is being recorded for use by our distance learning students and the satellite campus students and the various IA practitioners around the world. And so it's be, as well as being live streamed across the Blackboard network of the college. So with that, I ask if you engage in conversations or questions with the presenter that you move forward to one of the microphones on the table. So those of you that are sitting on the out seats, you might want to reposition or at least be aware of that if you engage in the conversation. It's important for that so you can be picked up and heard by all those folks that are listening to it as well as our recording. All right, let's get to the briefing. The ultimate high ground, space. As stated in our national security strategy, the U.S. must maintain leadership and freedom of action in space. In addition to our ever-increasing dependence on space-based systems and information, other governments and private sector organizations are continuing to increase their own actions and influence into that particular domain. Our presenter today will discuss current and future space initiatives as well as some of the many government agencies invested in space operations. Mr. Thomas Gray, serves as the U.S. Army Space and Missile Defense Command's liaison officer to the U.S. Army Combined Arms Center in Army University. He has responsibility for the integration of space knowledge and education across a variety of TRADOC, joint, and other service schools to include the U.S. Army's Command and General Staff College. Mr. Gray is a retired U.S. Army officer. He's a level three space professional of the U.S. Army Civilian Space Cadre. He holds Space Operations Officer designation of three Yankee and has earned the U.S. Army's Master Space Badge. Mr. Gray holds a bachelor's from New Hampshire College and earned his master's from Central Michigan. Please welcome Mr. Thomas Gray. Thank you. Probably the only time I do get some applause. Um, so great opportunity to be here. And, and this is really kind of a conundrum because I am here to talk about interagency, but I work for the United States Army. And so that's, that's kind of a really interesting thing, because, for example, when the CIA comes, it'll be CIA rep. When it's DIA, it'll be DIA rep, and it'll be folks who actually work in those organizations. I work for the Army. So the question then falls, why would somebody come here from the Army to talk about interagency lecture series? Doesn't make sense. Well, the issue is, is we don't have any of the agencies that actually do space here to be able to represent. So I am the surrogate represent, representative for those agencies that do space. So welcome aboard. I'm glad you're here. Um, as, as noted by uh, Mr. Cox, I spent my time in the uh, Army. I, most of my career was in the field artillery, integrating fires at the operational tactical level. And then in the Army's infinite wisdom, they determined they needed a professional space cadre. And so I was one of the first F-A-40s that the Army made way back last century. Uh, and so my mission is to be able to help facilitate the education of the armed forces to understand the integration of space capabilities to conduct war fighting across all of the domains. And therefore, we come to the point of Department of Defense pretty much is embroiled in space capabilities in the space domain and have been for a long time. 
But then when you start thinking about, okay, who else does space when you're talking about the United States government? It's not just the Department of Defense. So when you start thinking about who, who plays in space, what are their capabilities, what are the limitations, what are their, what are their reliances on space, and what's that mean to us as a Department of Defense who really does space and those that really use space. And so we have to start thinking about what that means. Um, there, is an, there is every space capability, someone in some agency is using it. They may not own it, but when you talk about as, as Mr. Cox alluded at the beginning, when you talk about national security and national capabilities, who is reliant on that domain of space in order for us to put forth our national strategic objectives? And then what are the agencies and what are the capabilities from a whole of government perspective in order to be able to put forth our national objectives? And so, I am here to kind of address those things, and I'm going to focus pretty much on just a few of these agencies. I mean, I could pick any one and I could talk, but I'm going to talk about some that have some primacy and, and what that means, and then we can, at the end, interpret that as you go forward of who are you integrating in your military operation when you're talking about geographic responsibilities and strategic objectives and who are you going to be including in your whole of government response in order to be able to achieve the national objectives? And what does that mean for us? So might be worth talking a little bit about what are the space reliances that we do on a continual basis as a nation? And probably first and foremost, when you think about it, is our ability to communicate. And so when you start thinking about telecommunications, what's that mean? Uh, news, how do, how do we know? I mean, if you look at the controversies that are going on today, especially with something like, uh, oh, let me pick the low-hanging fruit, Afghanistan, okay? So we know uh, pretty accurately the things that are happening in that country we know about the drone strike on a certain individual and the casualties that are there, and we know it almost, almost instantaneously. Uh, you want to go back two centuries, you wouldn't have known it for months. And so now it's instantaneous communications, the ability to see, to know, to do. And so the telecommunications that allows us as a nation to be able to go forward and uh, perhaps share information with those of our, our friends, maybe to share information with those who are not our friends. Uh, we go back a, a few years and we know that we did a strike in Syria in order to be able to put forth our will based upon the use of uh, uh, chemical weapons. And so we conduct an operation, well, in order to provide security for that, communicate to those who are in the area that we are coming in, understand our intentions, Russia, that we are not coming in to attack you, but we are going to send a strong message to that Syrian government. So please ensure we are coming in, this is when, do not engage us because we are not engaging you. And so that's a communications piece and that's security. And so that involves, for example, oh, I don't know, Department of State, maybe just a little bit, uh, understanding the diplomacy that needs to be able to make that happen. And so the communications get to be really critical, especially when you talk about knowing and being aware. Uh, not only communications, but then what then also um, facilitates our communications. And I think there isn't a person in here that hasn't at some point in time used a GPS to be able to figure out where am I, where am I going, and how do I get there. But more importantly is the timing. Global finance works on common timing protocol. 
Anytime you swipe your little credit card, little ones and zeros, travel along the fiber optic highway and then come back and you walk away with your product and you're happy. And so now you've got all of these ones and zeros, the ability to, to do computer networking. So a lot of people often ask, well, what's the difference between cyberspace and space? Well, space works because of cyberspace and cyberspace goes through space. And so ones and zeros, the ability to communicate, to be able to do timing, to frequency hop, to be able to do anything, relies on common timing protocol and GPS is the global standard. So understanding where you are, how you are, and what time is it, is all based on a space capability. And if you think about the threat to us, our electronic grids work on space. A lot of your traffic signals are all on timing, common timing protocol from computer systems that integrate that. Our hydroelectrical capability, the plants. So it's a very, very big reliance and dependence on the GPS capability, national security. Uh, speaking of national security, other capabilities we think of, and we've, we're watching the news lately, especially about the development of hypersonics. Uh, big in the news right now is the understanding that China are, are building more silos and we're worried about the nuclear threat that may be coming from that direction. We're watching the ballistic missile testing of North Korea and understanding that uh, is that possible for them to do intercontinental and are they developing a nuclear warhead? And what does that mean for our national security? And the ability to detect that, see that before it's already on its way in, but as it's being launched, how do we then engage and to be able to understand in order to protect our homeland or even in the theater? And, and so we look at these capabilities and then there's also the indications and warnings eyes and ears in space, the ability to see, to know, to understand in order to be able to engage uh, both verbally and if necessarily, diplomatically, kinetically, who knows, but the ability to do this. And not only that, uh, for example, uh, currently California, major fire issues, Today was a wonderful day in Kansas. I could actually see blue sky instead of haze. Uh, but when you look at that, how, how and where are the major fires in that whole West Coast area? And we can then help FEMA in our response crews to be able to go in and battle those fires. So another national ca space capability that supports our national interests. And then I don't think there's anybody who doesn't sit there, at least in some manner or fashion, understand the weather. I mean, if you want, I know most of the students here do not watch the weather on the TV. They get it on their phone. But if you take somebody who's an obsessed motorcyclist, the last thing they do at night is look at the weather. And the first thing they do in the morning is look at the weather. Because it doesn't mean you're not going to ride. It just means what type of clothing am I going to wear? And so understanding that, and so for us, understanding what are the hurricanes that are coming in, what are the floods, all of those kind of things, the environmental monitoring. So pulling this down from a national perspective, there's a lot of capabilities that we integrate, that we rely on for our national well-being. And we have to understand who runs those? Who's interested in that? What are the capabilities, what are the limitations that our agencies need? And how do we integrate that with Department of Defense? And how does that work from interagency to be able to do business? Now, that is kind of interesting when you say, okay, space domain. Kind of a new sort of thing. How long has it been around? When have we really started doing this space business? Well, um, if you get down to it, you say, first to put up a, an object, man-made object in space, okay? So you have Russia launches Sputnik in October of 1957, all right? So now you have a man-made object in space. Next to put something in 
orbit in space, not including Laika the dog, which was the second thing, but who would be the United States three months later, January 1957. And, oh, by the way, just because I do work for the Army, understand it was the United States Army that put up the first satellite. Uh, just, just saying. Uh, and then you start thinking about what are the other firsts that happen in space. So you get the first man to orbit space from Russia. You get the first man from the United States after that. So let's see, they put up the first satellite, they put up the first animal, they put up the first man. They put up the first woman to go into space. The Soviet Union also had the first space walk. Okay. And then you start looking at this for 65 and going forward, and then we're now talking about the race to the moon. And of course, we all know that the United States got there first. And that's probably because our Germans were better than their Germans. And so we go forward and you start saying, how much happens in the domain of space? And this is a short development line, okay? You're 60 years. It's not much. It's pretty cool. So today, when you start looking at what this all means, we start seeing camera in space, weather from space, missile warning from space, telecommunications from space, and what's that mean to us as a nation? So when it comes down to that, in 1958, the very first United States space policy was actually the NASA Act that established NASA in 1958, June of 1958. NASA, the science of space, the exploration of space. Let's go to the moon, let's go, let's go to Venus, let's go to Mars, those kind of things. So let's talk about some of the agencies because we are pretty used in the Department of Defense to think, we do space. Well, you know, if you look at who the first astronauts were, it was all test pilots. It was all military test pilots, first in space. But they were doing that on behalf of NASA. So the thought process that ought to start right away, connect the dot, is interagency operations, Department of Defense with a government agency in space starts right at NASA. Our capabilities, who launched? Army, Air Force, NASA. So what does NASA do and how do they do and where do they do? Because there is some big DOD collaboration. Uh, today, as of this year, the commander of US Spacecom has set up a memorandum of understanding and agreement with NASA to talk about uh, space awareness in the cislunar area. Cislunar basically means in the orbital realm over somewhere in the range of the moon. And so who's doing what, when, where, why? We watch the news. The news says China and Russia are going to collaborate for manned presence together on the moon. What's that mean? Is the moon part of a DOD perspective? Is it just a NASA perspective? Is it just science and exploration? Who's doing what where? And as we look forward as a nation to conduct operations in the realm of the moon to be able to use that as a jump start to get to Mars, what's that mean for us? Who's doing what to whom where? So how much does a, an agency, NASA, rely on space? Well, that's their business. How much do we as a DOD need to integrate with space from a strategic perspective? And, and what's that mean to our national security? And so we see interagency play already, even starting way back before 1960 in the domain of space and what that means. Uh, and so research development, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, other agency in space, the NRO, National Reconnaissance Office. Uh, up until 1992, I couldn't even say National Reconnaissance Office. It was such a classified program. Now they have a gift shop. 
And so with that, what's the NRO do? It's an agency, okay? It's the office. And so with that, they are the eyes and the ears in space. Surveillance, reconnaissance, done, so we can get an understanding of what's going on up there. And so we, in Department of Defense, have to understand our integration with the NRO and some of the things they're doing today, especially as we see the advent of the growth of commercial space and how that's growing in, in, in our realm when you look at something like SpaceX, uh, Planet LLC, which has a constellation of imaging satellites. That constellation is the flock and each satellite is its own dove and it's about the size of a bread box. And their, and their mission is to image 100% of the planet every day. What's the DOD integration with that? And how much is the NRO now talking about getting out of big, massive, expensive satellites and going into constellations of CubeSats? And what's that mean to us as a Department of Defense as we're trying to know, see, understand what's going out there in order to be able to prosecute our military instrument of power on behalf of the United States. And how do we as the Department of Defense understand the agency integration on those kind of things? Then you see the Department of Commerce. You say, well, well wait a minute, what? Department of Commerce? Space? What? All I have to do is say one, one company and it all comes clear. SpaceX, Pfft. boom. Uh, OneWeb, Amazon, <laughs> Blue Horizon, and you start looking at the real purpose of space when you go back in history was the exploration of space, but the commerce of space. How many people have Sirius XM? How many people watch TV? And do you have an aerial on top of your house bringing in an over-the-air broadcast? No. You're getting cable. You're getting streaming downloads. And all of that is coming through a space-based backbone in order to be able to, to provide that. And so the Department of Space Commerce gets to be pretty critical, especially when you talk about the economic strength of this nation. Something like SpaceX bringing up a bunch of civilians and splashing them down. How much money is being made? Bring it, launching for other companies, other countries, and bringing in OPM, other people's money. That economic power and, and, and the commerce that's brought there. I mean, if you go back historically, historically, the Navy really was to be able to perfect, protect commercial shipping. And so today, what are going to be the DOD requirements in an interagency perspective to be able to protect commercial space? And who's the integrator of that? Uh, happening, happened this year, and it's, it's uh, continuing to be worked out, is a memorandum of understanding between the United States Space Command and the Department of Commerce. But who's going to be the traffic manager of outer space. Who tracks and identifies and says who's where and what? And the thought process to that is, for example, Commander U.S. Spacecom said, well, the Department of Defense doesn't, doesn't manage air traffic over the country. Who does that? It's the FAA. Well, why should the Department of Defense be the traffic manager of space. That ought to be a, an agency. And so this, this uh, thought process in the near future is going to be transferring over to the Department of Commerce to actually do the notifications and warnings of, of conjunctions between satellites that may be coming too close to each other and talking to other countries and talking about the commerce of space. So agency-wise, a lot of different players out there who actually have primacy in space 
And we in the Department of Defense have to understand that. Uh, and even, even going so far as the National Oceanographic Atmospheric Administration, the weather. How important is the weather to military operations? Well, a lot of operations have been scratched or modified because of weather. Wherein the US Air Force used to actually command their own weather satellites, they no longer do. It has been relegated over to, the, to NOAA in order to actually run those satellites. But the, the military can't do without understanding the effects of the environment, and that includes terrestrial weather and solar weather on military operations. But then from a civilian agency perspective, then you also need to start thinking about shipping and air and land. Uh, as we've been watching the flooding, as we've been watching the hurricanes and understanding the changes in climate change, if you look at DOD policy, uh, one of the major uh, pieces of the current DOD strategy is understanding and recognizing the effect climate change is having on, say, for example, Navy, U.S. Navy ports. What, what the weather did to, for example, Homestead Air Force Base during, during a hurricane, all of those kind of things. Weather gets to be very important. So, primacy on these. There's also, as of 2018, a new agency which now has just been subsumed directly instead of being just a separate government agency. It is now subsumed into the Space Force under the Space Support Command, the SSC. However, it has direct reporting to the SEC Air Force, and this is the Space Development Agency. So it is an agency that is currently looking at the future of where we're going of our space capabilities. For example, let me go back to GPS and how critical it is. Easy to interdict, easy to disrupt or deny or degrade, and how, how critical is GPS to our national security? And so we have to start thinking about, are all of my eggs in that one basket? How do I, how do we get assured access for navigation and timing? And so they're looking at how we can develop a space capability that will not subsume, but certainly provide us supplementary access for assured navigation, positioning, and timing. And it, uh, looking at the current threat and where the threat is going with hypersonics with North Korea and China and Russia and Iran and the growth of ballistic missiles. And so how effective is our early warning system and can we do better? I mean, we can see it launch, but how do you track it once it's launched and it's already in outer space? How do you track that? So they're building uh, systems, constellations, testing them in order to be able to get full track from launch all the way through mid-course and into terminal phase in order to be able to provide us that warning and that ability to engage and, and get our safety and security as, as a nation against threat missiles. Uh, they're looking at very much the same sort of thing that uh, Starlink and OneWeb are doing with a low Earth orbiting constellation to provide secure uh, broadband uh, internet capability? Well, they're also looking at from the uh, Space Development Agency is how do we disaggregate some of these big communication satellites that are easily interdicted by simple jamming methods and then turn it into a constellation of satellites so if you hit one it doesn't matter because there's going to be so many more available. So we're taking from a Department of Defense perspective some of the initiatives that we're seeing that the commercial is doing and then integrating it through our agencies to support our Department of Defense and our nation. That, my friends, is probably the shorthand cliff notes of agency capabilities from space 
And what does that mean when you're talking about interagency? When you take the 18 intelligence community members, integrating the capabilities we need from space to do intelligence, and who are the organizations that use space, and how do we as a Department of Defense, so as you go forward in your coursework, and you get a directive from your instructor and later on down the line from your commander to, that we have this issue we need to face. What is the military response that we can put together? Give me a course of action. But then we as planners, integrators, synchronizers of military capabilities also have to think about who else plays in this? What are their capabilities? What is the domain of space doing and how are they helping us achieve the nation's end state from a whole of government perspective? So I give to you the agencies and a perspective from the agencies from a Department of Defense guy talking about what are their capabilities, what are their limitations, what's that mean to us, and how do we integrate that as we go forward as field grade planners for military operations. Uh, so at this point, I would like to say thank you so much for your attention and for being engaged. And I will then, if necessary, address any questions that might, you might have. That includes the people out there, too. You can, whatever you want to do in, in, in Blackboard land. Ah, I have a question coming forward. Yes, sir. It'll turn on. Staff Group 5 Delta. My question, sir, is uh, with the spider web of interagency, who's going to have the primacy under the POTUS for America that can control and unify all of the competing interests? Okay. Out of all these agencies, who's the top dog? Who pulls it all together? This is what I love about being in the Command and General Staff College because you know what the schoolhouse answer is. And it is, it depends. <laughs> I love it depends. Where are you? What are you doing? To whom are you interacting? Where are you interacting? Uh, what is the end state you're looking for? Which then says, what are the means to get you the ways to get to that end state? So it depends. Who's in charge? Are you doing a diplomatic thing? Then you'd probably say, I'm going to acquiesce probably to the Department of State. And, you know, it, it depends. Uh, you know, is it economic and commercial? And maybe is the Department of Commerce? Uh, is it a military operation? There's definitely Department of Defense. Hello. You know, what are you doing? So there really isn't. It's kind of like the family. You got five kids. Who's in charge? None of them. All of them. One of them at one time, depending upon who has the expertise. So uh, each one of these has a capability. Each one of them has a lane. But as with anything, all the lanes kind of integrate. You know, I could say this from, I'll put it to a military perspective. You got the five domains. Which one's in charge? Which, who's in charge? Is it the air domain, the land domain, the maritime, the cyber, the space? Who's in charge? It depends. Exactly. Are you doing an operation space? Then it's probably going to be that geographic combatant commander, but you're going to have probably some sort of means down here. Oh my God, multi domain operations. You may have some means down here, terra firma, trying to get an effect over here, terra firma, but what the effect it's doing is going to actually be in outer space. So uh, that's the, probably about the best uh, capability I can answer that question is that, yeah, there is no answer because it's all situational dependent. Thank you for the question. Would you move forward and talk to the mic so that somebody, the folks on the outer stations can hear you? Can hear you. Okay, well, I don't know if that's going to help my broken English. We don't care. 
If I can understand it, they'll understand well, it. I, I just want to think back on the question that, that he had because it's a fascinating issue. When I was at US Stratcom, the Stratcom commander, which was General Cartwright back then, felt this problem that you brought up. And he stood up a Joint Force Component Command for Global Strike and Integration and assigned a flag to it and a whole bunch of people. Well, what happens? As he mentions, integration is not that now you're in charge to arbiter everybody else and where you go. Much as he would like that to happen, it's not going to happen that way. So the only way that that issue started getting resolved is at the planning table, we started putting scenarios and situations crossing from one geographic command to the other. A space has this, but not this other stuff, and it's controlled by the commercial. So w bottom line is, what ended up happening is identifying those situations, and in some cases, it ended up going to the Secretary of Defense desk to say, thou shall be the person who decides that situation. So I think you're right on the mark. It is, it depends. Uh, and, but again, we exercise and we do planning, and that's when you need to actually go ahead and try to iron those things out. But as far as standing at Joint Force Command and Command, you're in charge of integration and you'll tell everybody else how to do it. That is just not realistic. And it's a foot fight when you least want to have one. That's for sure. So great question. I hope that I did justice to, to you, my friend. Thank you for the amplification. I cool. appreciate it. You bet. Anybody else have a question? Yes, ma'am. So regarding SpaceX and commercial endeavors, is there, are there any national security concerns, you know, at the, at the highest level when the missions and the priorities between commercial endeavors, which are primarily probably entrepreneurial versus national security from a government perspective, can you talk a little bit about who's stepping on whose toes, what the primary concerns are with that, and uh, how you see the next few decades, if you will. Oh, yeah, thank you for the tough question. Because in this case, it's going to be Tom Gray's opinion. So it's, it's what it's gonna be, based upon where I, where I stand is where I sit, and I'm sitting here, so I'm gonna just try and tell you where I stand on that. Um, anytime there is a commercial endeavor uh, in space, it can be somewhat concerning. For example, for example, uh, let's go back the last 20 years. Last 20 years, uh, we'll talk a, a coin fight, a coin fight, um, and you ha you were engaged in a against an enemy that had owns no space capabilities, but they're certainly using them. They're getting them. They're buying them. And so the national security uh, concern in that case was is they're using satellite telephones, they're buying commercial imagery and targeting us off of it, they use, they're accessing weather just like we are. Uh, so, so you can see they're, they're navigating with our GPS. What? Uh, so, so when you look at that, the, that's very low level, very tactical. When we look at getting up operational, even strategic, great competition. Uh, when you look at the domain of space and what that means commercially, who's going to be buying SpaceX time on their Starlink? And how much are they going to be using our system? How, how dependent will we get on that system and then how much are we going to be held hostage based upon our reliance on a commercial system? If you look at uh, the strategic threat of how we have developed a dependency on GPS timing to run our power grid, and then if we got involved in, let's, let's just do a hypothetical. Uh, we saw Russia had so much great success in reintegrating the Crimea. Let's say they want to open up their own road through Lithuania to be able to get to that Russian enclave that's just on the other side of Lithuania. And, and, and well, they had so much success, they're going to they're run that way. What's the easiest way to, to strategically to affect us to not be involved? 
How about they mess up what's going here, cyber and space-wise, in the United States so that we get so com confused and, and worried about what's happening here that we don't have time to help over there. Then there's the power competition that says, for example, we have really good imagery provided by somebody like Planet LLC, uh, Worldview, uh, GOI, DigiGlobe, whoever, whoever's the commercial provider. Well, who else provides commercial imagery? France has a real good system called Pleiades. Well, who else can have access to that? Who's friends with France? And that's a commercial company. And so you start looking at, can I regulate who that commercial company can do business with? And what's that mean? Uh, we know there are quote unquote laws on commercial fishing. But whose laws are they running by? Their country, our country. Who's fishing where, how's fishing where? Just take that and move that into space. What are the national strategic uh, implications of commercial support to whom doing what capability. We know, we know that we may not collect on our American populace from an intel perspective. Doesn't say a commercial company can't do that. That's a strategic issue. That's a national security issue. Who's collecting? How are they collecting? Where are they buying it from? How are they targeting? Uh, so so I, I think there's a, a lot of issues we need to think about as it goes forward. Uh, one of the other things to think about, these commercial companies, you see SpaceX is, is, is what, so they're at a little over 4,000 satellites up there now and they're gonna be going to 30,000 in low Earth orbit, what's that do to that domain? Uh, right now you hear a lot of scientists really complaining because I can't see the stars for all these stinking satellites that keep going through my field of view. That's, I mean, you can actually go for a jog in the morning, look up, and, and you can watch the satellites going overhead. How much is it going to be? And so that also becomes, if I need to be able to put up a critical capability, but the, the area is swarmed with all sorts of commercial capabilities, can I actually do the job I need to do with all these? And, and oh, by the way, my American company's putting it up. Well, let's say the China company, the French company, the uh, United Arab Emirates company, the, they say, we're gonna put up this huge constellation of satellites. Who's in charge? That gets, and what are the implications of that? And who's buying that information? And how are they using it, not only to support themselves, but maybe to promulgate against us? I think that's kind of where my thought process is on that. Yes, ma'am. That question answered the question. Time. Thank you, ma'am. Based off your answer, are there any international laws or conventions that are in place now that do dictate some activities in space similar to the international fishing laws and those type of things? Uh, so there is the, uh, uh, there are several laws, conventions, policies, national, international, et cetera, et cetera. The most all of it is promulgated on the Outer Space Treaty in 1967. And there are several modification conventions, the Registration Convention of 75, the Liability Convention of 72, the Moon Treaty of 68, blah, 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 blah. The biggest thing we find out about all of those laws and treaties is that they are very uh, forgiving rather than restrictive. So if it doesn't specifically say you can't do it, then you can. And so there are some uh, issues going on currently today that uh, are being addressed to say, do we need to readdress uh, international law policy to address the, the exponential growth that we're seeing right now in space? And that's being discussed now.
But as, as it is, stands today, we're living by the Outer Space Treaty in 1967. Any other questions? Ma'am. So I'll ask a less of a space question and more of a, um, an interagency planning question. So a lot of the strategic doctrine that we read always invokes um, a paragraph or so about encouraging interagency inter cooperation when we plan, right? So we know it's the right thing to do. We know we want to do it. We know we strive for it. But what it doesn't do is really say much more than that, right? So is interagency planning as simple as uh, inclusion? And assuming it's not, what would be your recommendations as we even here at school um, practice planning with, with this in mind? Gosh, I wish it was as, yeah, interagency, whole of government, we're planning and it says make sure you include all the agencies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is it, is it just as simple as inclusion? No. God, I wish it was. In some, ca in some cases, yes. For example, National Geospatial Intelligence Agency. They're right there with you. They're there. And they're in there. But, for example, later on in, uh, during, this, uh, during this lecture series, you're going you're gonna to hear from the USAID, for, you know, United States Agency for Internal Development. And we'll come in and do this military operation. And we won't ask them, who've been the boots on the ground for ages before we even get there, say, what can you tell me about this area? Who are the people I need to talk to? Who are the people I shouldn't talk to? What are the actions that I should do that'll help us, help them? Who's lying to me? Who isn't? Who are the folks I need to talk to? Talk to the State Department before you get there. Uh, from a tactical level, honestly, not as much, but field grade officers, you're now broached into this operational. Currently in the, in the course where you're in now, you're talking strategic. And so you're that bridge. So understanding your DIA, they're already there. The question is, is are you talking to them before and integrating it before? Or are you saying, oh, yeah, yeah well, we're already in war gaming, so what can you do? No. If you wait till then, they're doing nothing. So the, the biggest thing is it's not simple. It's not sprinkling it on after. But it's cognitively being aware of how are we getting a whole of government response to be able to achieve the objectives that the nation is looking for. That's the, that's the major crux. Good? OK. Uh, sir, come on, come on down to a microphone, please. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Mabu Siddiqui from MSC. Nice so to see you again. Uh, nice to see you. So my question here is, uh, over the years, we are relying on the satellite communication and you know, on space, basically. So my question here is, what if, for example, anti-satellite ballistic missiles are reality, and many countries have this uh, capability. So now question is, if we are in trouble in space domain, then what would be the alternative? What you can do in that case? OK. Yeah. Uh, in, in simple military terms, we call this a PACE plan. What's my primary alternate contingency and emergency uh, for backups? Uh, what, what is the what if if we end up in a denied, degraded, dis disrupted space uh, environment in order to be able to continue our national security? Um, and that is a very strong question because as we go forward, we keep working on putting more and more reliance on, on the space and the cyber domain. And, and those probably two domains are probably the easiest to interdict uh, in today's. And it's not even just the anti-satellite, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's electronic warfare, it's, it's, it's lasers, it's all sorts of things. Um, but as we go forward, uh, a lot of the things about making more robust capabilities, so if you eliminate one segment, it doesn't matter because uh, there's so many more available. Uh, other backups, what are your cables? What are your over the air? What are your back? And so a lot of things that are going forward as we move, as we project in the future, 
And that's a lot of what the Space Development Agency is doing, is how do we continue our shored access in order to be able to promulgate the capabilities that we need as a nation that are executed by all these agencies and the Department of Defense to put forth our national security. Uh, with that, I hope that kind of got to the essence of the question. With that, I would like to say thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. Uh, I appreciate it. I, I highly recommend uh, that you, you talk to your peers, uh, that uh, these things are worth going to and, and try and get your peers to come and, and make sure you come and listen to the CIA, DIA, USAID, et cetera, et cetera, as, as, uh, for the future of these uh, lecture series. So thank you for the opportunity to be here. Thank you, Tom. <laughs> uh, once again, I want to thank you all for attending this uh, particular presentation for our interagency brown bag. I want to thank again my partners, Commander General Staff School, and my sponsors, First Command. If you're a First Command client or you're interested in finding out what they do, see Matt Anderson back there. Raise your hand, Matt. Let him see who you are. Please stop by and talk to him. Remember, our next presentation in the series will be Wednesday, 20 October on the Central Intelligence Agency, will not be broadcast, so please plan to attend in person. I urge you to pick up on the way out a schedule for our events for this year. We have a little flyer that's got all of the presentations for this calendar year, or excuse me, for this academic year. Watch for the flyers. Hopefully you saw similar to this in email and posted on bulletin boards out and through the, through the school. And once again, I thank you all for attending. We hope to see you next time. Thank you.